Hello, everyone, and welcome to Registrar Corp's webinar entitled Six Factors That Affect Your Shipments to the U.S. My name is Jonathan Rhodes, a regulatory advisor at Registrar Corp. I am joined by my colleague, Sarah Gerganis, Registrar Corp's Director of Import Alerts. This presentation will conclude with a live questions and answers session. If we run out of time, we are also happy to respond to your questions by email. You may submit a written question anytime during the webinar by using the Ask a Question feature in the top center of your webinar screen. A recorded copy of this presentation will be sent to all registrants. I'd like to go ahead and begin. So today we're going to talk about, of course, the six factors that uh, can affect your shipments to the US. The overview that we have on the screen, we're gonna talk about product risk level, compliance history, your shipment to issue ratio, and so issues with those shipments, your FDA registration, prior notice, and labeling requirements. And so without further ado, uh, Sarah is, is going to start us off by talking about FDA's PREDICT system. All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So uh, I'm gonna start out with FDA's PREDICT system. PREDICT is an FDA electronic system that's used for determining shipments to examine or sample at the port. So essentially, FDA has limited resources. There's no way that FDA is going to be able to stop and examine every single shipment that comes into the United States. So it uses this system in order to kind of push its limited resources into the areas where they may be most useful. So the system is used to prioritize higher risk shipments, considering certain factors such as inherent product risk. So for example, a raw seafood product is likely going to be more inherently risky than uh, say like a shelf stable oatmeal product. It also considers the shipper's FDA compliance history. So a company that has uh, an import alert has been issued a warning letter and has multiple refusals on their record is likely going to be considered at a higher risk than a company that's been shipping for years and has never had any sort of compliance issue. And in addition, FDA also uses a randomization method for an additional level of security. So even if you're shipping a non-risky product and you have no history of compliance issues, you still can be stopped randomly by FDA for an inspection just to make sure that your products are in compliance. A few other factors that can alter the PREDICT score include an invalid registration number, labeling errors. So if your product labels do not comply with FDA regulations, having a failed FDA facility inspection, or having consumer complaints on your record. So uh, FDA will look at these PREDICT scores for each shipment that's coming into the United States, and that will help them determine whether or not to, uh, to stop that shipment. And though there's no way for you to see your own PREDICT score, it's just an FDA internal system. Um, the, the system works because a higher score is worse. So if you have a lot of risky products and it, a poor compliance history, you're going to have a higher predict score, and that will cause shipments to be sh to be stopped more often. Whereas if you have low risk products and no history of compliance violations, no failed facility inspections, you'll have a lower score, and your products will typically be able to pass through port with less issues. So the first factor that we're going to talk about today is the product risk level. So I kind of touched on this on the last slide as well, but certain types of products have a higher level of risk. And what I mean by risk is the risk of causing an illness outbreak. For example, if a product is contaminated with salmonella that can make people sick when they consume it, or other types of contamination. Perhaps you have a product that was grown, like an agricultural product, say apples um, that were grown in your country under the regulations of your country and a particular pesticide is allowed there, but that pesticide is not allowed for use in the United States. So the FDA would want to ensure that a product contaminated with pesticides that are not allowed in the United States are not being sold in the United States. Or another example is 
products that can have pathogen growth um, in the products. And so FDA high risk products are more, more likely to be stopped by FDA um, upon entry into the US. So we put some examples on the right side of your screen of some products that can typically be considered high risk. As you can see, a lot of these are agricultural products, um, which could easily be contaminated with something that can cause an illness or with a pesticide that may not be allowed for use here. Other examples are shelled egg products and seafood products. So along with discussing product risk, I wanted to touch on FSMA. Um, you see the abbreviation at the top of your screen, FSMA. This stands for the Food Safety Modernization Act. And it's a, an FDA regulation related to food safety for the sale of goods in the United States. Under this act, you have something that's called the Foreign Supplier Verification Programs. So these are for U.S. importers. And they require that U.S. importers must analyze reasonably foreseeable hazards associated with foods that they import, as well as document the controls of these hazards. And the importers may conduct more thorough and frequent verification activities when buying higher risk products. So uh, essentially, if a U.S. importer is looking to work with a foreign supplier to, to buy a product, they need to understand the manufacturing process that's occurring in your facility and understand which risks are, and hazards are associated with that process. And they need to have documentation to ensure that they know that you have the correct controls in place to control for those hazards. And uh, if you're, they're buying a higher risk product from you, perhaps they need to do more verification activities. So if they're buying maybe a raw seafood product from you, they're going to potentially ask for more letters of guarantee or certificates of analysis, or perhaps they'll ha require you to have your facility inspected by a third party more often, something to ensure that they have documented that you have the correct controls in place. In addition to the foreign supplier verification programs, there's another rule that is not yet finalized called the proposed traceability rule. And this rule would require that persons who manufacture, process, pack or hold foods that are on an FDA traceability list maintain records of key data elements at certain points during the supply chain. So this would just be another rule for risky products to ensure that the processing requirements and controls to keep are being met. So the next thing I want to, want to talk about is compliance history. So you'll see at the top of your screen um, in this blue box, we've listed a few things called FDA inspection classifications, import alerts, warning letters, import refusals, and recalls. These are all things that can affect your compliance history. So FDA is more likely to detain inspect or delay shipments if a facility has a history of compliance issues. So if there are import alerts, warning letters, refusals, recalls on your record, your shipments will be more likely to be detained because that will lead to a higher predict score, as we mentioned in the first slide at the beginning of this presentation. All of these things are public information, but FDA may not always inform the exporter when these actions occur. So in FDA's website, if you search around, you are, can find an FDA inspection classification database. You can find the import alerts and a database to show warning letters or search for import refusals or recalls. But none of these are in the same place. So it can be rather cumbersome and difficult to search for everything and all of these different databases on a regular basis. The only thing that FDA will absolutely discuss with you will be warning letters and recalls. So if FDA is sending you a warning letter, they will send you an actual letter to explain the compliance issues. And if FDA is requiring that you recall your products, then they will be in contact with you to ensure that you are going through the process for the recall. But if you have an import refusal, FDA is not necessarily going to inform the manufacturer. They will inform the importer but the refusal will go on the manufacturer's record and they will not inform the manufacturer. 
In addition, FDA will not inform you of an import alert typically. So unless you're checking for import alerts regularly, you may not find out that you're listed on an import alert until you've shipped your product to port and then it is detained under the import alert when it arrives. In addition, U.S. importers are required to monitor their suppliers for these data points under the Food Safety Modernization Act, and they may use this information to inform purchases. So because of those foreign supplier verification programs that I discussed earlier, these importers are required to check up on the compliance history of all of their foreign suppliers. So if they're looking to purchase from a supplier, and they've got two options, one supplier who is on an import alert, has a number of refusals on their record, and maybe they've been issued a warning letter or failed an inspection, and another supplier who has no history of compliance violations, they're likely going to want to work with a supplier with no comp history of compliance violations because it's easier to work with them. In order to work with the one that has more compliance violations in their history, they will need to perform more verification activities. So perhaps they will have to be requiring more inspections or other documentation in order to work with that risk supplier. So I've mentioned inspections a couple times now. So I just wanted to go through the different classifications that you can receive from an FDA inspection. There are three different classifications. The first one is NAI, which stands for No Action Indicated. This means that FDA came, they inspected your facility, and they did not find any, any issues that would require action on your part to fix. So that essentially means that you have passed a, an inspection. The next is VAI, which is Voluntary Action Indicated. This typically means that FDA found some small, small violations that were not completely terrible, um, some things that can be fixed rather quickly. So they've informed you of these things and uh, you've kind of jumped in and put steps in right away to fix those small issues. And then the third one is OAI, which is official action indicated. And this essentially means that you've failed an inspection. FDA inspected your facility and they found something that was a serious violation that could cause harm or illness if your product was sold in the United States. And so they're failing your inspection. And in this case, you will be issued a form 483 from FDA, which will go through and list all of the violations that they found during the inspection. Also want to touch on warning letters. These are sent directly to a firm with significant compliance violations. So if you receive a warning letter from FDA, they will tell you about it. It's not like an import alert where they won't tell you. Um, they'll send you a letter, and that, that letter will require that you uh, institute some corrective actions, whatever it may need to be, in order to fix the violation that um, they found. And typically, you have about 15 days to respond to FDA. And if FDA finds your response satisfactory, Factory. They may also a, issue a closeout letter if they feel that the violations have been corrected for. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is import refusals. So a company can ship a product that's in violation of FDA regulations, and FDA determines that the product is in fact in violation. They will refuse the product entry to the United States. Import refusals are a matter of public record. So if a product that you manufacture is refused, that refusal will be listed in your compliance history and can be seen on FDA's um, website by anyone. You have two options when you have an, a shipment refused. You can either destroy it um, where it is at port or you can send it back to the home country. And obviously both of these cases involve uh, time and money. So ideally, you want to try to ensure that your shipments are not refused. In addition, recalls can also affect your compliance history. Recalls are typically voluntary, though through the Food Safety Modernization Act, FDA does have the authority to require them if they feel the, feel the need. Um, recalls are essentially done to ensure that Products that are not compliant with FDA regulations are do not end up in the hands of U.S. consumers. So they want to ensure that if a product has been found, 
to be in violation. All that product is recalled and then destroyed. So people aren't buying it. There's three different classes of recalls. Class one is for products that may cause serious adverse health consequences. Class two is for those that may cause temporary or reversible adverse health consequences. And class three is for those that are not likely to cause adverse health consequences. An example of that may be something with a labeling violation that isn't related to to the health. It's a misbranding issue that's not related to the health of consumers. Perhaps the product accidentally showed up with labeling that was meant for the European market as opposed to the the U.S. market. And so it is not compliant with U.S. regulations and you want to get it off the shelves in the United States, but it's not necessarily going to cause a health issue. All right. And import alerts. You've heard me just say the term import alert a few times now, and I haven't really explained it yet. Import alerts occur when FDA notices a pattern of non-compliance from a particular company, country, or product type. With an import alert, all shipments of products that are listed on the import alert are going to be subject to detention without physical examination, which is called DWPE. So this essentially means if a product is subject to an import alert, it's going to be automatically flagged in FDA's system when it arrives at port, and it's going to be detained automatically. So the system will flag it, and the compliance officer is never going to bother to open a box and look into that shipment and see if it's actually compliant with all regulations. The fact that it's subject to the import alert is evidence enough for FDA to detain that shipment, and then they will leave the responsibility to the importer to prove to FDA that the shipment actually is in compliance before it would be released. And if they're unable to prove that it's in compliance, that shipment will be refused. So there's two different main types of import alerts. The first is a red list alert. These alerts are for companies that have a history of non-compliance. A company is only subject to the alert if it is listed on the red list. So a red list alert is created for companies that have been caught to um, to have a compliance issue. So for example, say that you are shipping applesauce into the United States and FDA randomly stops one of your shipments and test that applesauce. And they find a re- residues of a pesticide that is not allowed for use in the United States inside that applesauce. They're going to refuse that shipment because of the presence of that pesticide. But they may also then add your firm and your applesauce product to an import alert because now there's a history of violation of you shipping applesauce that is contaminated with the pesticide. So now every single time you send a shipment of applesauce to the United States, that shipment is going to be automatically stopped by FDA, and they're never going to open up a box to check and see if the applesauce actually includes the pesticide. They're going to wait for the importer um, working with the supplier um, to uh, perform a private lab analysis to prove to the FDA that there is no pesticide residue in that applesauce. And this will occur every single time. Even if you pass the the lab analysis each time and FDA releases the product, um, knowing that it has no pesticide residue in it, 10 years later, if you're still on an import alert, every single applesauce shipment is still going to be stopped. The other type of import alert is called a green list alert. So these alerts are for inherently risky products or violations that are common or widespread in certain countries or regions. And a company is subject to the alert unless it is listed on the green list. So an example of this type of alert would be an import alert for tamarind products. FDA has seen over years that there's a history of tamarind shipments being contaminated with filth. Shipments coming from all over the world being contaminated with filth. So now FDA has an import alert and every single shipment of a tamarind product that enters the United States is automatically detained without physical examination, and it will be the responsibility of the importer to prove that that shipment is not contaminated with filth. The only way to not be subject to this detention without physical examination is to be listed on a green list, which means that you have already proven to FDA that your shipments 
that you have controls in place and your shipments are not contaminated with filth. And FDA has added you to a list to uh, exempt you from that detention without physical examination. So in order to get off of a red list or listed on a green list, you uh, can petition FDA for removal from the import alert. These petitions are typically large and complicated, and they require a significant amount of documentary evidence of the corrective actions that are in place in your firm, as well as proof to, to FDA that the p- corrective actions are working over time. For FDA, the, uh, this proof comes in the form of compliant shipments. So in order to uh, be on a green list or removed from a red list, you have to have evidence of f- at least 5 to 12 shipments that have been detained by FDA under the import alert proven to be compliant, and then released by FDA before you can submit that petition for removal. The third factor that we're going to talk about today is the percentage of shipments with issues. So by issues, we're discussing compliance issues. So I think it's best explained with an example. So in this case, in the first scenario, We have a company that has sent a total of four shipments to the United States. Two of those four shipments have had compliance issues. The fifth shipment is going to be more likely to be stopped and inspected by FDA because 50% of the previous shipments have had compliance issues. And then in scenario two, a company has sent 100 total shipments to the United States. Five of those 100 shipments have had compliance issues. Now that next shipment, that 101st shipment, is going to be less likely to be inspected because only 5% of the previous shipments have had compliance issues. So even though scenario two, they've had a total of five shipments with issues, where scenario one only had two shipments with issues, which is less shipments because in scenario two, they've shipped so many more and it's only 5% that have had issues. Whereas since scenario one only has so few shipments, a significant portion of their shipments have had compliance issues. They're going to look like the more risky um, risky importer at that point. So having a smaller percentage of your shipments, having a history of compliance issues, means that you're going to be less likely to be stopped for an inspection by FDA when the products arrive at port. So if you have a lower ratio of issues in your shipments, you're going to have a lower predict score, and this will mean that it will be typically easier to get through port when your products arrive. Now I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, uh, Jonathan, to continue from this point. All right. Thank you, Sarah. And now we're going to kind of address the factors that typically would happen before you would send your products into the United States. And so the first one, and this is typically the first step that exporters take when exporting to the US, is the FDA registration. The FDA registration uh, was required under the Bioterrorism Act of 2002. And so in, in when that act was you know, put into law in 2002, it required facilities that manufacture process, pack, or store food uh, for consumption in the United States, including beverages and dietary supplements to register with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And um, facilities that are located outside of the United States must designate a U.S. agent for FDA communications. So that U.S. agent must be physically located within the United States and available 24 hours a day to discuss uh, regulatory matters with FDA on the facility's behalf. Um, so they're, they're kind of uh, a, a US form of representation for the facility. And FDA may send important documents uh, such as um, requests for inspection scheduling um, and, and other types of correspondence to the US agent. Uh, I also do want to point out, and it's not on the slide, that we typically see in our experience, um, companies talk about having their food product be FDA approved, having their beverage 
FDA approved, their dietary supplement FDA approved. And that is a, a, a very, very large misconception about how FDA operates. Um, FDA does not approve food products or beverage products or dietary supplements. What they actually do is they have this requirement to register um, and the registration signifies to FDA that I am manufacturing um, my confectionery product in my facility in Italy and I'm going to manufacture that for U.S. consumption. So I'm, I'm telling FDA where my facility is located uh, and what I'm doing there. And that's basically submitting information to FDA. It doesn't authorize um, me to ship, but it tells FDA that I plan to ship. And FDA in this case acts as the enforcer, similar to how um, in your home country and you're driving down the road, you have speed limit signs and you follow the speed limit signs because a police officer may pull you over if you go above the speed limit. Uh, FDA sets out these regulations, this requirement for registration, and you tell FDA that you're, you're shipping to the US and then they enforce the regulations on your products that way. Um, so the second part of the registration is the renewal of the registration. So prior to um, the Food Safety Modernization Act, facilities registered one time and they denoted to FDA that they were manufacturing food for U.S. consumption or they were um, packing food, processing it. But then if they went out of business, there was no requirement for um, them to, to tell FDA they were still in business uh, or if the, their company name changed. It, there wasn't a lot of, it wasn't very easy for FDA to keep a paper trail of that. So under the Food Safety Modernization Act, Act, FDA actually requires food facilities to renew their registration every two years on even numbered years. And this is regardless of when they initially registered. So for example, we recently had a renewal period that began on October 1st, 2020 and ended on December 31st, 2020. If a company had registered in September of 2020 that for the first time, they would have still had to renew during that October to December timeframe. So FDA is, it has standardized this renewal process and they require all facilities to renew during this time period. And I have on that third bullet point there that failure to renew equals a canceled registration. I'm going to go into a bit more depth about that uh, in a few slides, but just keep that in mind. For this registration requirement, there are a few exemptions. So I, I did mention that the requirement is if you manufacture, process, pack, or store food for consumption in the US. However, um, these types of facilities would be exempt from that. For example, trading companies. If a trading company is receiving a product and they're, they're just kind of forwarding it along, they're not uh, processing the product, they're not packing it, they're not handling the food directly, they do not need to register. Personal residences do not need to register. Transportation only, which, which kind of fits with the trading companies in, in some way, whereas I'm mainly moving a product from one place to another and I'm not interacting with it. Farms that only harvest uh, products are not required to register. So if I'm only harvesting nuts um, on a farm, uh, I do not need to register. However, if I process those nuts, so if I, if I roast them and then I package them, I am then required to register if, if any processing takes place in that facility. Retail food establishments are not required. Fishing vessels and facilities that are entirely regulated by the United States Department of Agriculture are not required to register. And so as I had mentioned before, a failure to renew during the renewal period equals a canceled registration. And so just to elaborate, in this past renewal period that ended on December 31st, 2020, uh, FDA waited until February, and then they, they removed 25% of food facility registrations that were not properly renewed during that renewal period time. Um, and so this, this ultimately ends up being thousands of registrations that are removed after every renewal period, and it's fairly consistent. Um, 
I, 2021 was certainly a high, but it's usually around 20% to 25%. And what often we find is facilities don't know that their registration has been canceled because FDA is not telling them that their uh, registration has been canceled until they ship a product to the port and they encounter an issue such as their um, product being detained because they do not have an FDA registration. So Registrar Corp um, offers a free service where we allow you to verify that your registration is valid anytime at no cost. Simply go to registrarcorp.com slash verify and just enter some uh, brief information, um, the registration number in the country, and we can tell you whether or not that's on file with FDA. A very important point to bring up that's a novel requirement is this unique facility identifier or UFI for short. So during this previous renewal period that began on October 1st, 2020, food facilities are now required to provide a UFI to FDA, uh, either the first time they register or in the case of all the facilities that already were registered when they had renewed this year. But now, um, a registration must contain a UFI that is now a required field. And so FDA currently only recognizes the data universal numbering system number. And so this is a, a Dunn's number for sure. And it's offered by the company Dunn and Bradstreet. Uh, FDA has uh, determined that theirs is an acceptable UFI to use and they require facilities to get a Dunn's number in order to be registered with FDA. Next, I wanna talk about prior notice. And this is another um, requirement, another factor that occurs typically, well, it should occur before a uh, product is shipped to the US. So prior notice is a notification to FDA that a shipment that you intend to ship is, is coming to the United States. And so for every food, beverage, and dietary supplement shipment, including samples that you may be sending to a customer or to a trade show, you must file a prior notice with FDA. If you don't file a prior notice and the shipment arrives in, in port, it's very likely it's going to be detained. This prior notice information includes information about the shipment um, and the facility. Basically, um, it's, it's who is shipping the shipment, who is the, uh, what are the products in the shipment, who is the manufacturer of those products? Are, are they registered with FDA? Uh, and who is the purchaser, the ultimate consignee of the goods within the United States? This can be filed by the exporter, it can be filed by the importer, or it can be filed by a third party who has knowledge of the shipment. So Registrar Corp actually has a prior notice express system that reduces filing times uh, and, and we strive to make filing the prior notice as simple as possible. When should I submit my prior notice? This is entirely dependent on the shipment's mode of transport. So if I'm shipping my, my product by road, I need to submit the prior notice at least two hours before the shipment arrives. If I'm shipping by rail, it needs to be submitted at least four hours before the shipment arrives by air at least four hours, by water at least eight hours, and I need to submit a, fi uh, file, a prior notice filing before the food is shipped by international mail. So before I, I put it in the package and I, I run it through the mail system. It's important to note that a shipment uh, prior notice filing should not occur 15 days before the shipment is supposed to arrive. FDA does, does not allow um, a prior notice 15 days in advance. And then the sixth factor that I want to discuss today is labeling. So the US Food and Drug Administration will define labeling as all labels and other written printed or graphic matters upon any article or any of its containers or wrappers or accompanying such an article. So this is kind of a complicated definition, but this may include your packaging. It may include any um, inserts that you put inside the packaging. 
It can even include your website. Um, FDA takes an approach where they, they may consider your website or your advertisements labeling for your product. So it's very important to make sure that whatever um, labeling you, you set forth with your product is compliant with the regulations FDA has. Um, this typically comes into play with, um, we, we, we typically think of a nutrition facts chart when we think of the labels, but labels are a lot more complicated than that. Um, there are a lot of things such as claims that we can make. So for example, if I am making a food product and I want to say that that food product is high in fiber, I need to have a very specific um, amount of fiber in my product to be able to make that requirement. And if I don't have that amount of fiber in my product, I cannot say that my product is high in fiber. FDA has a, a very specific definition. Um, the same with whether my food can help um, reduce the risk of heart disease. There is a very specific definition for being able to make that claim. And in fact, there's very specific language that you're required to use if you want to make that claim. So labeling errors are one of the leading causes of FDA detentions. They account for approximately 22% of all detentions in the United States. So as Sarah had mentioned earlier, a, a company might um, actually encounter a detention and they might even recall their products because they accidentally shipped products over to the United States that have um, labeling that is not compliant with the US market requirements or maybe they, they didn't know the labeling requirements for the US market and they shipped something over that just wasn't compliant. Maybe it had um, another language, but the rest of the label was not in that language. There are a lot of requirements that need to be considered. And so it's also very important to note that in 2016, FDA actually changed the format of the nutrition facts chart. They changed um, quite a few different labeling regulations, but most prominently, the format of the nutrition facts chart has received an overhaul. So on the left-hand side of the screen, we see the old label, which has been around since 1991. Um, and this is one that uh, United States consumers are very, very familiar with. Um, and if you've ever shipped to the US before, you, you probably are familiar with it as well. Then we have on the right-hand side, the new label format. So as of January 1st, 2021, all compliance deadlines for having this new label format have passed. So all food products that enter the United States must meet the format of this new labeling structure on the right. And so you can see uh, that we have some noticeable differences, such as some text that's a bit bigger and, and bolded, uh, like the calories declaration is, is much more prominent than it was before. However, there are some less obvious, uh, but very, very key changes to this format. We now need to declare added sugars to a product. So before we were declaring them as sugars, and now we need to declare total sugars and any added sugars in the product. So these can be sugars that are added um, during processing stuff that, you know, that's not occurring in the natural sugars of the product, but it also can be interpreted as added sugars to um, the American diet. And the, our, I apologize, our label specialists are better at explaining this than me, but there have been um, some particular instances with honey manufacturers and, and cranberry manufacturers uh, where FDA had required them to express their uh, sugars as added sugars. And the reason they gave was because it was associated with sugars added to the diet rather than added to the processing, even though they, they naturally occur in the honey. FDA also changed established serving sizes for some foods. So FDA bases their serving sizes on what are called reference amounts customarily consumed. And this is a standardized table of what your reference amount customarily consumed per product category is. And all serving sizes should be based off of this table. So you may find that um, what you had as a serving size 
now in your product, if you have the old label format, is actually different um, on, in the new label format because the reference amount customarily consumed changed. And then lastly, um, and the, of course, this is not an all-inclusive list of the changes, but some key differences. Certain nutrients such as vitamin D and potassium are required to be declared on the label. So you can see on the previous label, uh, we didn't need to have vitamin D and potassium. On the new label, we do. And not only that, but we also must declare their quantities, their, their actual quantities in micrograms or milligrams next to them, in addition to the percentages. So before we move on to our, our questions and answer session, I just want to briefly talk about how Registrar Corp can help with all of these factors. And the very first thing I want to talk about is a, a newish software product that we're uh, very um, excited about introducing to you, and that is Facility 360. This allows you to monitor your facility's compliance and monitor shipments associated with your company. So as Sarah mentioned, uh, FDA posts inspections, warning letters, import alerts, import refusals, and recalls as public information. However, they're hard to find. Um, if I'm looking for that information on my own company, it's gonna take me a, a bit of time to find that. So what Facility 360 does is it centralizes all this data that FDA has published about your company into one place and will actually email you and notify you when that information changes. Ad additionally, um, we will monitor shipments that are associated with your company and let you know when FDA has published shipments that are associated with your company. And this is in an effort one to see um, kind of whether you have any products that have a propensity to being detained or refused. Um, you can analyze patterns that way, but you can also identify shipments that might not be um, what you expect them to be. So maybe uh, sometimes there's a practice called gray marketing where somebody ships a product over to the United States without your knowledge um, from a local market. And this software we kind of designed in, in that mind to help solve that problem. Uh, you can learn more at registrarcorp.com slash facility360, and you can use this promo code webinar10 to get 10% off. Just to touch upon those points that I just brought up one more time, it helps you identify unauthorized shipments by detecting suspicious filers and shipments associated with your FDA registration number. It can help you minimize detentions by analyzing trends in your products. And you can secure your reputation by tracking what has been published about your brand. Um, typically, this is information that your importer may be looking at or, or a potential importer may be looking at. So you actually have an upper hand in being able to see what an importer can see about your company. And then lastly, we also assist with all of the other requirements that we discussed today. So registration in U.S. agent services. We are the U.S. agent to uh, about 16,000 companies worldwide. Our service includes assistance with getting the required uh, UFI for your registration. Um, we assist with a full label review so we can review your product for compliance with the FDA food labeling regulations and we'll provide you a ready to use um, product label that you can stick on your packaging. If you go to registrarcorp.com slash label and you upload label assessment and you upload your current label, we can also conduct a free preliminary assessment of it. We assist with prior notice filings. As I had mentioned, we have our prior notice express system, which reduces filing times by 50%. We also can help with detentions. If you run into a problem with your product in the port and your product is detained, give us a call and we will communicate with FDA on your behalf to help seek the speedy release of the shipment. And then lastly, import alert petitions. Sarah had, had talked a lot about import alerts today. Um, and Sarah is the one who actually handles these import alert petitions. She has a very high success rate uh, at getting companies off of import alerts. 
So now we will go ahead and we will move to our questions and answers. Uh, I would again like to announce that we will be sending a recorded copy of this webinar and a PDF copy of this presentation to all of our registrants. And you may submit a written question anytime during the webinar by using the ask a question feature in the top center of the webinar screen. I'm going to go ahead and very quickly and stick our contact information on the slide. If we're unable to get to your question today, you can contact us here uh, at info at registrarcorp.com or you can reach out to one of our 19 offices worldwide uh, that their contact information is available at registrarcorp.com slash offices, and they can provide you multilingual and regional support. So let's go ahead and look at our questions. So our first question, why would a nut butter be considered a high risk product? And this is a great question. Um, so the products that I we had in the, in the slide earlier that when Sarah was talking about the high risk products, those are representations of what FDA has actually put on their proposed traceability rule list. So we had mentioned that there's a proposed traceability rule and FDA is going to require products that are on that list to have certain tracking elements attached to them uh, should the bill be passed. Now, nut butter um, FDA has deemed is considered a high risk of contamination uh, through studies that they've done, and they're they're maintaining that list and, and determining that nut butter is considered a high risk product for the purposes of that food traceability list. Now, that list is not an all inclusive example of the product risks that Sarah was talking about earlier. Um, but it's just a, a good benchmark for what FDA might consider because they actually have a list now that tells us um, things that they consider to be high risk products. Our next question, can you please elaborate a bit more about what a green list import alert is? Sarah, would you uh, be able to uh, just go back over that one more time? Sure. So a green list import alert would be an import alert where you're subject to the detention unless you're on the green list. Some examples include the one I already mentioned for tamarind products. So all tamarind products from anywhere in the world are going to be stopped and detained automatically when they get to the port unless a company has submitted a petition to FDA to uh, prove that they have all of these controls in place to ensure that their tamarind product is not contaminated with filth. And FDA has accepted that petition and added them to a list, which is essentially a, a free pass to go without the detention. So the product is tamarind, it's flagged automatically, then FDA sees that, oh, this manufacturer name, address, and product type is actually listed on this green list. Okay, never mind, we'll let this product go. And so it doesn't end up being detained. All of that happens automatically in FDA's system. A few other examples of uh, green list import alerts. There's uh, one from, for um, products that contain milk containing um, ingredients from China. There was a history of uh, products. This, including, this includes things such as actual dairy products like a yogurt or something like that, as well as maybe cookies, things that just have an ingredient that includes dairy in them. So all of those products that contain milk ingredients that are coming in from China are going to be automatically detained um, for appearing to be contaminated with melamine. FDA started this alert years ago after finding numerous products um, that contain dairy being contaminated from melamine, specifically with melamine, specifically for manufacturers in China. So now there's this import alert and every single dairy containing product that is shipped by a Chinese company will automatically be stopped unless that company has submitted a petition to FDA to show that they have controls in place in their manufacturing process to ensure that there is no melamine in their product before it is sent to the United States. FDA reviewed that petition, agreed that the controls were appropriate, and added them to that green list. So now they ship the product 
first FDA thinks, oh, this is a product that contains dairy from China, we should flag it. And then it sees, wait a second, they're on this green list, this product from this manufacturer is listed on the green list, this product can go ahead and move on through because it's on the green list, it's no longer subject to the import alert. All right, thank you, Sarah. Our next question, does the prior notice also have to be filed by private citizens um, or for private citizens? And the answer is yes. So any product that is be, being shipped to the US, um, a food, beverage, or dietary supplement product, including a sample that is for commercial or personal slash private use, a prior notice must be filed for that. So even um, we, we do encounter situations where people are shipping products um, from Italy to, to family members in the United States or from Germany to family members in the United States. And they, they are required to file a prior notice with FDA. Um, our next question, I saw one that was fairly interesting. So I'm seeing a question about um, what to declare for the added sugar in honey. And this is a great question. Um, unfortunately, I, I'm not particularly an expert in this area. However, I do encourage you to reach out to us at that email address I have on the screen because our labeling specialists um, are very knowledgeable in this area. But there is a specific FDA guidance that they released um, discussing how to declare the added sugars for honeys. So for example, um, you would declare the added sugars um, as specified in the regulation, but FDA has allowed for a um, the inclusion of an obelisk symbol next to the added sugars that refers to a disclaimer that states that the um, sugars occur naturally in the product. And there's, there's very specific language surrounding that. Um, and it's a very specific um, disclaimer that FDA would allow someone to use under this guidance. But I do encourage you to reach out to our team with your questions and we can um, answer the questions you have about your product label for honey. Our next question. Um, will my food be denied entry if I am under import alert? So Sarah, will my food be refused or denied entry? So it will not be automatically denied entry. If you're on the import alert, that means that specific product that is listed on the import alert will be stopped um, and detained by FDA when it arrives at port. Once it's detained, you have a, a, a small period, usually it's about 15 days, to respond to FDA. So if you believe that your product actually is compliant, then uh, that response to FDA, depending on the import alert, the particular import alert, for example, if it's for a contamination reason, such as pesticides or salmonella or melamine, typically the response should include a private lab analysis. So once the product is detained, you will need to work with your importer to arrange for a private lab analysis um, to have a lab come sample the products that are detained at the port and produce a lab report to send to FDA. And if the lab report comes back clean, showing that your product um, is actually not contaminated with the, the substance that FDA is claiming, then FDA will review that that lab report, um, accept it, and then release the product. So if you are able to prove to FDA that your product that's on import alert actually is compliant, they will release that shipment. But it will be it will take some some time. It won't be released right away. It'll take it'll typically be a couple weeks to even a month or more, depending on the type of violation, before FDA would release the shipment. Thank you, Sarah. Our next question. What will happen if our U.S. agent is not physically located in the United States? So this is a great question. The regulation for having a, a food facility registration requires a, an agent that is located physically in the United States. 
Uh, so it can, the agent should not be located anywhere else. They must have a physical address that is within the United States. And so that being said, I, I, I can't say for absolute 100% uh, sure, certainty what FDA will do because we are not affiliated with the FDA. But uh, we have in our experience see FDA cancel registrations in, in certain aspects, um, such as if they, they find that the data is incorrect. So in the past, we've seen FDA cancel a registration that um, if there's two registrations for the same company at the same location, they have canceled registrations there without warning. Um, they may do the same in this case, or they may contact um, the facility to, to ask some questions about their US agent. However, I, I, I can't say for sure. All we know for sure is that the regulation requires the US agent to be located within the United States. Our next question, would pet treats slash snacks need to be regulated by FDA? And this is also another great question. Yes, pet treats um, are, are regulated by FDA and they're kind of an interesting scenario because they must register, they must follow um, FDA regulations for animal feeds, and they must also file prior notices. But they, when it comes to their labeling, there's some joint labeling requirements between FDA and AFCO. And AFCO stands for the Association of American Feed Control Officials. And so um, when, when doing um, labels for, for pet treats and, and that you need to be aware of what requirements you need for FDA purposes and what requirements you need for AFCO purposes. Our next question, could you please explain if there is a difference between bulk products and end consumer products in terms of food labeling? So yes, there, there is. Um, you typically, the bulk products may not require as strict of labeling as end consumer products. Um, however, there are certain areas, and again, our, our labeling specialist, I wish um, our, our labeling director was here to answer this question because I've heard her say it a thousand times. There are certain things that you might have in a bulk product that might classify it as an con end consumer product and you would be subject to the end consumer product labeling requirements. So there's there's pretty extensive regulations. And if you have any questions about your product in particular, I do um, encourage you to reach out to us and we can actually have some, um, one of our label specialists contact you. Our next question, can we dispatch material without FDA registration? So if you are going to ship a product to the United States and you are not exempt from registration, meaning um, you, you know, if you manufacture, process, pack, or store food that's going to be consumed and then, and then you send it off to the US and then it arrives in the port, it's very likely it's going to be detained um, because it does not have a registration. And, and FDA, um, will refuse products that they detain that don't get a registration. So in, in short, you can send it, um, but it, you're going to encounter problems in the port if you do. Um, so I, I, it would be advised against to do that because what ultimately happens is it, when Sarah said if a, a product is refused, um, FDA requires it to be destroyed or returned to the home country. So you would want to make sure that you have your registration everything in order before you get it over to the United States. And then our last question, uh, we are running short on time, but we're gonna take one more question. And that is, do I need to comply with the foreign supplier verification program? And so this is an interesting question. The foreign supplier verification program at rule, as Sarah had mentioned earlier, is for US importers to verify the food of their manufacturers um, and the suppliers that they import from. So a company that is based outside of the United States whose importer needs to comply with FSVP, they need to comply with a, a 
FDA food safety requirements that fall under the preventive controls uh, rule, which we did not cover today. Um, but we have plenty of information if you go to our website on the preventive controls rule. Uh, and that basically requires food facilities to maintain a, a written food safety plan for the products that they handle at their facility. And so the importer on the other end needs to conduct their own hazard analysis of those products and they need to conduct their own verification activities of, for that supplier to approve that supplier and provide adequate assurances that the food that they import is safe for consumption in the U.S. So um, a, a U.S. exporter does not need to comply with FSVP. However, they have a role in it in that the U.S. importer may ask the exporter for documents or other information uh, so that they can provide the adequate assurances uh, that they're required to provide. So we are out of time, but as I mentioned, you can send us additional questions anytime by email to info at registrarcorp.com. Um, a lot of these sp very specific questions, I do encourage you to reach out to us and we will um, get them answered for you. This concludes our presentation uh, and I would like to thank everyone for joining us today.